I'm a little bit short of time. It's a little bit difficult to explain all the matters, uh, all the connections between notations in American literature, British literature, our literature, and that takes time. So what we have to do now is to find a solution for given sources, find the unknown, find the fields. A direct solution of the Maxwell equations is not practical. It does exist, but it's very difficult to solve. So what we are going to do, we are going to define a new quantity that's called the vector potential. The vector potential, we usually use the letter A with the vector sign, is defined uh, uh, through the magnetic field. So the uh, magnetic field, magnetic flux density is equal to curl of vector potential. Only the curl is defined. The divergence of the vector potential is not defined. Uh, if we look now at the second Maxwell equation, we see that uh, curl of E is equal to minus omega. Here we have curl of B. Curl of, uh, curl of A. Curl of A, not B. Okay, because this is, this is the magnetic field density B, eh? as we have defined it. Uh, now, what does this mean? Maybe vector E is very well related to the vector A. But we have a curl operation between. So uh, since we have a curl operation, uh, a curl of E plus J omega A is equal to zero. Now if a curl is equal to zero, uh, this does not mean that uh, this thing under the curl should be zero. The curl of any gradient field is always equal to zero. So uh, E, we can rewrite that E is equal to minus J omega A. But we can add to this equation any arbitrary gradient. So gradient is nabla that operates on a scalar field, a scalar potential V. V is scalar potential. The same as we had in electrostatics. Uh, the curl of any gradient field is always equal to zero because we have cross products of two identical vectors, twice nabla. Uh, cross of product of two, of two identical vectors is always equal to zero. So we see that uh, we have defined both the magnetic field and the electric field out of two potentials. Vector potential is A and scalar potential. So this is, this is our A. Seems complicated, but it solves many problems. Where uh, are these problem going, problems going to get solved? Uh, if we use the Lorentz gouge, uh, we said here that only the a curl of the vector potential is defined with, uh, with Lorentz, Lorentz without T. Lorentz, this was a Danish physicist. Lorentz with a T was a Dutch, uh, Dutch physicist, so we have to be careful. Lorentz says that the, the divergence of A should be chosen, we can choose it freely, should be chosen as minus J uh, omega uh, mu epsilon uh, scalar potential. If we make this choice, then the resulting wave equations for the scalar and vector potential do decouple. And we had a single wave equation 
for the vector potential. Uh, and another similar equation, so again Laplacian operator on the scalar field V plus k squared uh, V, V here not A, V, V is equal to minus charge density divided by permittivity. Uh, now I have to explain these wave equations. As long as we did not define the Lorentz gauge, uh, these two equations remain coupled. With the Lorentz gauge, the two equations decouple, uh, and we only have currents that generate the vector potential and charges that generate the scalar potential. With this Lorentz gauge, this is an arbitrary choice because, in theory, only the density of vortices of A is defined, not the density of sources. The density of sources is the divergence, the density of vortices is the curl of A. What quantities do we have here? We have, we have this letter K, and K is now the wave number. In the wave equation, so K squared is equal omega squared mu epsilon, so omega frequency squared times permeability times permittivity. That's how we obtain two wave equations. Uh, what is useful for us is that these two wave equations have an analytic solution, so we can finally calculate something after so much theory. Of course, uh, calculating with uh, Maxwell equations, all functions have to be uh, well behaved, have derivatives, all functions should have, should have derivatives, and the same when using differential equations. What is the Laplacian operator? The Laplacian operator written as delta, this is nabla times nabla, so in Cartesian coordinates this is uh, second derivative over x squared plus second derivative over y squared plus second derivative over z squared. But uh, in arbitrary coordinates, we do not know how to calculate this thing. This is just for Cartesian coordinates, how to calculate a Laplacian. We will see that the Laplacian is much more complicated. But uh, now we can try to find our solution for the fields in an analytic form. And we know these solutions are under the, the name retarded potential. This is an analytic solution of the two wave equations. And we have the potential A at coordinates where we observe the potential is here mu over 4 pi. Uh, integral over the sources, uh, with the sign prime, I will uh, symbol that this is the volume of the sources here. Uh, we have currents here, so we have uh, J of the coordinates R prime uh, times here. Below we have the distance, R minus iris R prime, so this is point of observation, this is point of the source, and uh, so it decays with the distance, and on the top of this equation I have the delay. The delay is written as an exponent function, a minus uh, j k, where j is uh, square root of minus 1, k is the wave number, and here I have the same distance, r minus r prime d volume prime d of the sources. So if I know where the currents are, uh, I calculate at an arbitrary place in space what is the vector potential over that. It's a closed form solution of this wave equation. Uh, the same ret uh, retarded potential also applies for the scalar potential v of r so of the point of observation, is now 1 over 4 pi epsilon, so permittivity, integral over the volume. Here we have sources, so charges, as a function of r prime, uh, multiplied, so r minus 
vector r minus vector r prime, uh, the decay with distance, and uh, the delay, the delay on top, and, and it's the minus j k uh, r minus r prime. Written in frequency domain, in time domain, it will be a little bit more complicated to rewrite the same equations. But I said we are going to calculate all these things in the frequency domain because it's simple. All our radio antennas operate over a relatively narrow frequency range, so frequency domain is actually very advantageous for us. We have formulas for retarded potentials, so we have sources. There is a simple way to calculate the retarded potentials. We can do this with a computer. We need not do this by hand. And then we have formulas how to get the fields out of the potentials. Everything uh, put to an order. Uh, we uh, derived all these equations at the electrodynamic course. So if you things are unclear here, please have a look at all of the recordings of the electrodynamics course, but that's 45 hours of lectures. I cannot squeeze 45 hours in 15 minutes here. I can just say what, what we discussed over there. And now, armed with all this knowledge, uh, this uh, wave number k is also e related to the wavelength. This is 2 pi over lambda. And k has the units uh, radians per meter. How much does the phase change per unit length? And that's the reason why it's using the delay, because this is meters. This is wave number, so we get the delay in radians, and we get the phase in radians. This is the delay on top. And in the denominator, we have only the distance is 1 over the distance, so uh, inversely proportional to the distance. Uh, in electrostatics, we can forget the delay term, because there is always static. Everything is static. And maybe you saw this formula already at the fundamentals course in the first year for electrostatic problem for having charges, electrostatic charges, uh, calculate the potential of electrostatic charges without the delay because you didn't even think that there is a delay. But uh, special relativity requires a delay. There's nothing, no way we can escape it. Now uh, we want to solve a simple antenna problem using these things. And time is running, so. Uh, I don't know how to do all these things in the limited amount of time. First, I always draw the coordinate system. X, Y, Z. And uh, I put a segment of wire, short segment of wire in the coordinate system. This wire carries the current I. And this wire has the length L. Uh, we want to calculate what? We want to, at arbitrary coordinates R, we want to calculate the vector potential, also the scalar potential in this point, and we want to calculate the B and H, B and E fields. So to see what fields does it generate. We make two simplifications here. Uh, simplification one is that we take that R is much larger than the length of the wire. So we observe this at large distances with respect to the wire. So we want the range of our transmitter to be much larger than the size of the transmitter. That's, that makes sense. Because if the, the range was the same, same order of magnitude as the size, this means that uh, uh, that it was better to, to put the wire from the transmitter to the receiver, not to use actually radiation. And the second simplification is that this wire is much shorter than the wavelength. This will also simplify our case. Wavelength, where is wavelength is 2 pi over wave number k. This is also a simplification. And we try to use the retarded potential to actually calculate our vector potential. How does it change now the retarded potential? Well, this is approximate. Uh, mu over pi stays where it was. Uh, 
some assumption I do is that we have free space here. And epsilon is equal to epsilon zero. The, so the electric, uh, the electric uh, permittivity and permeability are those of free space. So I'm not writing this zero here because it already adds com confusion to the table. Uh, what is this integral over the volume? If this wire is short, I can, this uh, current density j on the wire uh, is actually equal to the current E divided by the, uh, the cross section of the wire. But the element of volume of our source is actually the cross section of the wire times dl or dz, dz. Because we're under the axis. So in the integral, this cross section of the wire cancels out. I only have no current. Uh, yes, I forgot the direction. This is 1z. This current flows in the uh, z axis, so I forgot the direction. So we have 1z. We have the current i. Uh, cross sections of the wire cancels out because this is already found here, this cross section. Uh, we have the ratio here. A to the minus k. Uh, so now this difference, if this r prime is small because l is small compared to the r, if I l is uh, small, I can use this approximation one to change the, the, uh, the denominator just to r. Because r prime can be neglected if, uh, uh, if r prime is much smaller than r. Uh, it's uh, r prime is smaller than l, so this is smaller than, uh, larger than r, r equal to r prime. So if this is small, I can neglect this term here, r prime. And in the numerator, I said that uh, uh, this is also, l is also larger than r, r prime. So the phase change introduced by this L or R prime because this is small compared to the very well is small. So uh, in the numerator using simplification two, I can put just R. Use only R. So this is much much simplified using our simplification. So we got the vector potential. Here. Uh, now this vector potential has only one problem: this expression. And uh, the problem in this expression is that one z is not a unit vector, a base vector in a spherical coordinate system. This r is a spherical coordinate. This is constant, this is constant, but this is a Cartesian coordinate. And that's a problem. And now we have to see what the one z decomposes in. Uh, if we have here one r and one theta of the uh, one theta of the uh, spherical coordinate system. And the connection between the two is quite simple, but you have to know it. You have to make the projections of one theta and one r on the axis z, and you see immediately that one z is now expressed in the Cartesian coordinate, expressed if it's spherical coordinate, is one r times cosine of theta minus one theta times sine of theta. If we simply make the projections here, we have the angle theta. If we have the, make the projection of these two on the axis z, and here we have the uh, vector 1z. So the whole solution of the vector potential for such a simplified problem is now uh, 1 r cosine theta minus 1 z sine theta. Here we have uh, mu times i uh, times uh, the integral if we go from minus l half to half l half is still an l here. My 
L uh, over 4 pi. Uh, and I have the direction. I have everything here right now. And the only missing thing is uh, this R in amplitude and phase. Phase is minus J K R. This is the complete solution for the vector potential. Now, from the vector potential, I would like uh, to. Prasim? Is not there by the. Sorry, from the sinus of theta, different than the minor vector of theta. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you. This is one theta. One theta. I forgot this. I made this mistake. One theta. Thank you for uh, pointing out the error. So, uh, I would like to calculate the vector h right from the definition. So, vector h is now 1 over mu. Uh, curl of A. And uh, to calculate this curl of A, we have to see how does curl calculate in spherical coordinates. The curl in spherical coordinates actually is, has this form. Curl of A in spherical coordinates has the form 1 over h1, h2, h3 for arbitrary cur curvilinear coordinates, uh, h1 times 1 q1, uh, base vector of 1, h2 times 1 q2, h3 times 1 q3, base vector in the coordinate 3, uh, derivative over q1, derivative over q2, derivative over q3. And here we have h1 times the first component, a1. h2 times a2, h3 times a3. Uh, this complication with uh, Lamé coefficients is due to the curvilinear coordinate systems. So h1 is equal to 1, so this does not exist h2 is equal to r, h3 is r times sine of theta. So if I calculate now the vector field h, this is the curl, 1 over r squared sine theta, so this is h2, h3, uh, taking the curl, taking the curl 1, r is the first coordinate, uh, r times 1, theta is the second coordinate, uh, r times sine theta, 1 phi is the third coordinate, uh, partial over r, partial over theta, partial over phi, and now we have to see the components we have. The components we have, uh, this mu cancels out, I didn't even mention this. We have 1 over mu here, we have times mu here, so this mu cancels out. Uh, we have uh, the r component has the cosine of theta. So i l over 4 pi uh, uh, exponential minus j k r over r. And we have cosine theta. Uh, the final component is zero, so r sinus theta, uh, but multiplied by zero because we don't have a phi component. And the theta component is uh, minus, because we have minus sinus theta, i l over 4 pi, uh, e to the minus j k r over r uh, sin theta. But we have here the Lamé coefficient r. So this is actually minus r, the Lamé coefficient. This actually simplifies our life of derivation because this r and this r cancel out. And now we have to compute this determinant to find the solution. So do we have an r component? No, because we der derivate 0, so this is 0. And if, if we derivate over phi something, this thing here is not a function of phi. So this is zero. So we have no r component, you see. Do we have a theta component? We derivate over phi something that is not a function of phi. So 
if it's not a function of phi, then it's derivative over phi is zero. And we have a derivative over r of something that is zero. So we no have no phi component. We, uh, we no have no theta component. The only component we are left is this phi component. Because phi component, this is a, a, the function of r uh, to the minus jkr. And this is a function of theta because we have the cosine theta here. So we only have the one phi component, and that's that's uh, our life makes our life much easier. So we only have uh, for h, we only have the one phi component. Uh, r sine theta, r squared sine theta is one over r, in the beginning, and now we have to compute the determinant in here. So this derivative is positive, this derivative is negative, computing this subdeterminant here. So derivating this function here, the only thing that's a function of r is e to the minus jkr. So the, uh, calculating this derivative, uh, derivative over r of e to the minus jkr, this is minus jk times a to the minus jkr. So this derivation actually gives us minus jk. Uh, minus jk out of the derivation. And everything the rest I have to rewrite it. I l uh, for pi. Uh, uh, without, without a fraction. So e to the minus jkr here. Uh, sine theta. Sine theta is not a derivation. This is the derivation, the deriving, derivating this thing over r. Uh, minus this derivative here. Uh, this derivative here is uh, over theta. The only thing that depends on theta here is this cosine theta. The derivative of cosine theta is minus sine theta minus sine theta here. Uh, so we have uh, minus sine theta plus, and the minus sign of the determinant is plus sign, plus sign, uh, I L for pi, uh, uh, I L for pi. And then we have And the derivative over r we had already made it. Then we have uh, uh, this term here. We just rewrite it. e to the minus jkr over r. And we have sine theta. I'm a little bit concerned about this minus, but we got it correctly. Was well, derivative over r? Eh. I forgot this minus sign here. We have derivative that gives minus jk, but I forgot this minus sign here. You see, so this is plus minus and minus give plus. So I, I knew it was something wrong here. I would it. So you see that this expression now can be much simplified. Much simplified in what a way? You see sine theta is the same with both e to the minus jkr is the same. So we have one phi is the direction of the magnetic field. Uh, the multiplication factor i l over 4 pi is common to both. Uh, is common to both e to the minus jkr, that's common to both. Uh, expressions. Uh, then we have jk over r for the first, jk over r for the first one, and we have 1 over r squared for the second one because we have r here and r here, and we have here times sine of theta. I don't have place on my board to write more. So what about now about this result? Well, sine theta should be written here, but I don't have space on the board to write it further. Do we have an explanation what is going on here? Uh, yes. 
This thing here, 1 over r squared, is the bios of our law. From classical fundamentals of electrical engineering. You maybe wrote in a different way. There was a cross product in your bios of our law, but the cross product actually gives the sine theta. We know where this sine theta comes from. It's the cross product. Uh, we don't know anything about this term here. This term here is radiation. And this is the new thing we have to deal with antenna. No longer electrostatic problems, but we had to solve all the equations in the correct way. Uh, also, this expression here, sometimes it's called the extended Bios Savar law. Bion Savar couldn't invent this because they lived 200 years ago where no one knew anything about radiation. So they couldn't do this thing, they couldn't do any experiment because the frequencies they were working were very low, were DC mainly, with DC currents, uh, but radiation is here. How do we have get the corresponding electric field? The corresponding electric field, we can have it out of the Faraday law, uh, of the Ampere law. So, uh, curl of H is now equal to J plus uh, uh, the uh, J, uh, J omega displacement current uh, epsilon E writing uh, the displacement field with uh, displacement field with electric field with epsilon. Uh, so how do we solve this equation? First at, uh, where do we have to solve this equation to get the electric field? We have to solve it here. And up here, j is equal to zero, up here. Not here. We have to solve, we have to get from the vector potential, we have to find the electric field. Uh, and uh, we already found the magnetic field, and we just take this curl. So we just uh, rewrite this thing as electric field is now 1 over j omega epsilon uh, curl of magnetic field. Now this curl is something I really don't have the time to do. Look at the amount of calculations. We only have the phi component here. Okay, we only have this component that's different from zero. Only this component will be different from zero. But which components do we get in the final result? Electric field, this component has, depends on R. So we have derivatives over R. So uh, we have uh, the theta component we have because we have derivative over r. And it's also a function of theta because of this sine theta. So derivation over theta, we also have the r component. So we, here we have something, the result of this thing is something like 1 r and something plus 1 theta and something. Five terms we get in total. Uh, let's try to look at the largest term. Which term will be the largest? At long distances, the largest term will be the one that has the lowest power of R in the uh, denominator. And which one does it have? So we take also only this, this term, and we have to der derivate this term over uh, which, uh, which will give us the smallest power in the bottom, uh, if we uh, make the derivative over, uh, if we make the derivative over r, but we have r on top, r in front, and now that's not, not the way to, do, to go. Uh, and further we have this a e to the minus jkr, we have also this derivative. Uh, so the largest derivative at long distances will be only this one. So we can approximate this at long distances, very long distances, like only derivative that, that will derivate over r, because if we derivate this thing over r, the only large derivative is the phase. 
at large distances, only the phase is important. Uh, and everything else remains the same. So we have one theta as from the from the matrix. Uh, we have one over r times sine theta from the uh, from here and here. And then we have to derivate over r uh, this thing here, over r, this thing here. And if we derivate all this expression over r, okay, we have, this is a constant, i over i l, no. First we have r times sinus theta, we have from the determinant, r sine theta we have from the determinant here. Uh, this is the Lamé coefficient 3, h3. Then it's uh, i l over 4 pi is constant. Uh, e to the minus jkr, this actually we take the derivative, minus jk times e to the minus jkr, we derivate this. And we take this as a constant. This, this is a function of r. But we can take it as a constant because uh, uh, this derivative is much smaller than this. The derivative of the phase at long distances is much larger than the derivative of the, the, the amplitude. So we simplify this and we only write the term that's larger at long, uh, big distances. So jk over r at big r is certainly much bigger than 1 over r squared. So we only take this term uh, jk over r, jk over r, uh, and we don't take this term, we neglect this term. We neglect this term and we neglect the derivative of this one. We simplify things as much as possible. So this is radiation only. Radiation only. Uh, these two actually cancel out. Uh, I forgot, uh, I forgot this term. So this term I forgot, I have to still write it. 1 over j omega epsilon. I have to rewrite this thing. Uh, so uh, I have 1 theta is the direction of this approximate solution. This is not the complete curl that would give us five uh, uh, members. Uh, I L over 4 pi. Uh, 1 over uh, so we have uh, minus jk times jk, minus j times plus j, minus j times plus j is 1. So we have k squared uh, uh, over r, and we have still this term here. Uh, so this one and this one cancels out, and we still have this term 1 over j omega epsilon. Uh, still I forgot, I forgot, I forgot this sinus theta since I didn't see it here. So sinus theta here, sinus theta, sinus theta. It's a very lengthy, lengthy uh, derivation and I have little time here to do it. Uh, so this thing here is again complicated. Why? We have both the wave number here and the omega epsilon here. And uh, these things are related actually, are related type here. So what we usually write the result, we, write the re we do write the result in the terms of the wave number. So the bare k is equal to omega square root of mu epsilon. So k over, we have k over omega. k over omega is just square root of uh, mu epsilon. And we have further a division with epsilon. So uh, if this is fur further divided by omega epsilon, we have to divide by epsilon, this thing here, by epsilon. So the whole result is, and we have j in the uh, denominator. So we have now electric field E. Uh, uh, 
electric field E, we have J in the denominator, okay, we have uh, one theta, we have uh, I times L over 4 pi, we have uh, uh, K here, we have uh, J is in the numerator and uh, what is the, I still forgot something, this determinant, this term is positive, this term is negative. I still have one minus sign from the, from the determinant, so this is one minus here, one minus here. Uh, so one minus here plus the j in the numerator is a j in the, uh, in the numerator, it, from the denominator it's a j in the numerator eating up this minus sign here. Eating up. And I have this expression here, k over omega epsilon, this is actually square root of mu over epsilon, this is actually the wave impedance of free space. Uh, so this is uh, z, uh, z zero here, and uh, uh, we have sinus theta. And this is the approximate solution for far field, for r much larger than lambda. Far. I simplified this just not to have to calculate all the, all the, all the derivation here. Now uh, we have the approximate electric field. Of course the near field should have much stronger uh, reactive components here. While uh, this field at large distances, this approximation for E, makes, uh, uh, shows us the radiation field, so this is only radiation only here. So this thing here also applies here, radiation only, what we got up here. Uh, now what we want to do is at large distances, to calculate the power flow. The power flow is given by the pointing vector. The pointing theorem states that the power flow, S is now uh, E uh, electric field times magnetic field uh, conjugated Conjugated, ma conjugated magnetic field because we have to find the phase between the electric and magnetic field. So this is like, like we have for uh, real power, uh, we have uh, pow real power is now one half power is one uh, voltage times current conjugated. And we have one half here, also for the point vector. We can try to make this calculation here. So is one theta times uh, one phi, one phi. One theta times one phi, the direction of this power flow, radiation only is one r. One theta times one phi is one r. So the power flows out of this antenna. Uh, we have uh, something squared here, uh, so we have I I star L squared 4 pi squared and we have this half here, I should also write the half here, down here. Uh, we have, we only take the first term here, K, we, we neglect this a term because this at large distances, this vanishes, this term at large distances. We only take this. This is k over r and we have uh, uh, over r also here, over r, we should have here over r. We forgot to rewrite this one here, forgot to rewrite it. So we have uh, uh, minus, so here we have uh, uh, J, J, 
times, times, times j here. But this j here, due to the asterisk, becomes minus j. So j times minus j is equal to 1. Uh, we only take this term, the radiation term, and we see what is left over. What is left over? Okay. Uh, k here, we have k here, and we have k here, so it's, it's k squared. k squared is z uh, impedance of free space. We have it from here. Uh, we have then the final term is sine squared of theta divided r squared. This is radiation only. Uh, radiation only. And how much power do we radiate from this antenna? Uh, the power we radiate, the power is now integral over the whole sphere of this S uh, times uh, normal times differential of surface. So this is uh, the differential of a sphere. Uh, S times the normal is 1 R to this sphere. We enclose our transmitter. Uh, the differential of A, differential of A in spherical coordinates is R squared sine theta d theta d phi, differential of theta, differential of phi. So R squared uh, sine theta, differential of theta. Uh, we have to uh, integrate over all possible polar distances, d theta, and over all uh, longitudes, d phi, d phi. To get, uh, if we enclose our transmitter, we enclose it in a sphere here. And this here, sphere has a normal one end. And we are trying to get the whole power radiated out of this antenna. Uh, what do we get? Several things do cancel out here. I have to cancel something so that we get enough space on the board. So the power actually is what? Uh, this integral of the, the sphere goes from theta from 0 to pi and for phi from 0 to 2 pi. So now I rewrite the terms I have. Uh, so I had this constant term here. So this is i absolute vert squared. So this is i, i, pri, i star is i squared. We have l squared of the distance. We have uh, uh, wave number squared. We have impedance of free space. Uh, in the bottom, we have 2 times 4 squared is 32. We have uh, pi squared at the bottom. <coughs> this r actually cancels out r squared, cancels out here with our. Uh, 1 r times 1 r is equal to 1, if we look here. So this is always equal. Uh, we have uh, no, no influence on the lo uh, longitude. The longitude integrated from 0 to 2 pi gives us 2 pi. But we are left with the integral over theta from 0 to pi. Uh, and we have sine of theta. Uh, here we have sine of theta squared plus another sine of theta is sine to the third power of theta, d theta. Now I don't have the time to solve this integral, I just have to pull out the solution. This integral here solves to uh, four, four thirds. Four thirds, this is four thirds. So the whole radiated power is now how much? The whole radiated power. The whole radiated power is i to the absolute uh, squared times L squared times k squared times z0 over 2 pi and 32 pi squared is 16 pi uh, times the 4 thirds of the integral. This integral solves to 4 thirds, but we don't have actually today the time to solve that. Uh, so the whole solution becomes now uh, 
12 pi and with all the terms above i squared, l squared, k squared, z zero. This power is given to our circuit. Where is it given to our circuit? It is given with a generator in the uh, here, the generator here, like in a Tesla coil. So the, our circuit is actually our generator. Wire has some inductivity. The wire ends have some capacitance, so we have a capacitive loading here. But this thing cannot absorb power inductivity here. This thing cannot absorb power. We have, we also should have, a radiation resistance. And this is new, actually has no uh, radiation resistance, this radiation resistance has no analog in the static fields. So power could also be called, that this power we have here, this is one half, half, uh, radiation resistance, I to absolute squared. So we can see that this radiation resistor is now is how much? Radiation resistor is, is L squared, K squared, Z zero, uh, divided by 6 pi. Because 2 and 12 cancel out. This is actually the, what does this radiation resistor? This, uh, the power dissipating of this resistor doesn't turn out to heat. This is the radiation, the power that goes from our antenna out to infinity. And this is the new thing with radiation, with antennas. Uh, the problem with this radiation resistance is that it's very, very small. If we look at the experiments of Nikola Tesla, around 1900. Uh, Nikola Tesla had what? What were the data of Nikola Tesla? He had a tower that was perhaps 30 meters high. He used a wavelength of 10 kilometers. And uh, if we take that Z0 is approximately free space impedance at 377 ohm, we get from this his, uh, if we calculate what is his radiation resistor, his radiation resistance here is, uh, I believe this result is 7.2 milliohms. Nikola Tesla was unable to measure such a low radiation resistors. Uh, his experiment failed. Failed because around 1900, people were competing, many different inventors were competing to make the transoceanic uh, communication. With such a low resistance, no matter how, how high a current he had in this, his device, he radiated only perhaps a maximum of one watt of power. That's not enough to cross the ocean, especially not with the detectors he had at that time. So his radiation resistance, uh, his, radi uh, his efficiency, so uh, his efficiency was given as uh, this radiation resistance, uh, radiation, radiation, divided by the sum of all resistances he had in the circuit. And uh, his radiation resistance was below 0.01%. So from 10 kilowatts, he radiated 1 watts. 1 watt, about, 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 below, about, about, about 0.01%. So very low radiation resistance because his device was much smaller than the wavelength, and he didn't know this. Because Nikola Tesla, I believe, he didn't even understand the difference between radiative field and reactive near field. We shall see these things in the future. Today, unfortunately, I don't have the time to develop the whole five terms of the electric field to see the whole discussion. Uh, in this course, we should, do ma um, should make better than Nikola Tesla. In fact, other people did much better than Nikola Tesla in the first years after the turn of the century, after 1900. Guglielmo Marconi established reliable 
communications mm -hmm. over the Atlantic Ocean. So some, someone other did the job. Unfortunately, even Guglielmo Marconi didn't know much about the theory. He was just experimenting. But uh, compared to Nikola Tesla, Marconi was experimenting in the right direction. He tried to do communication. Nikola Tesla uh, tried to do big sparks, big electric fields. Big electric field, big near radi re reactive electric field, does not meet good radiation. So Nikola Tesla ended up as the best wizard of the West, while Guglielmo Marcona is the, is the inventor of the radio. That's the end of the story. We should try to do better than Nikola Tesla in our course.